Hopefully this rascal will show up where I can see some comments as I go along here. Um, all right, looks like we got some, some people already starting to show up. That's cool. Sorry I'm running late, everybody. It was kind of a longer meeting this morning than I originally anticipated, so. But you'll have that. So, let's go ahead and dive into this bad, bad rascal so you guys can kind of get an idea. When you start, knowing that we're starting with the bare bones republic, right? There's no bar association. There's no, um, there's none of that, you know, extra crap, right? Let's start with the basics, the original thing. <clears throat> and one of the main problems and um, reasons that we get dismissed from courts is because this bar association has these judges who consist of bar members convinced that the only ones who can work in that branch is bar members. Well, by technical definition, that in itself is an act of treason. And here's the reason why that ministerial army that Kirk talks about, we've, we've mentioned it on last night's show, even that's the ministerial army that's referred to in the, in our history. So when we talk about how they've inserted themselves with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever, um, in the declaration of independence, what he's talking about is what they're talking about is that action. Our biggest mistake was allowing them to get away with it again. Well, I walked in again, starting with the, the bare bones Republic and said, look, I understand exactly what you guys are trying to do. Um, I'm not going to let you get away with it. So, because this is our style and form of government, not that four pillar bar association. So, and I don't know if that's one of you guys calling me, sorry, but I'm not answering it while I'm doing this course. So, <clears throat> um, anyway, so that said, another reason that these processes fail is because courts are a forum, okay? Now, forums are designed for one thing, prosecute bad actors, okay? That's what we would use a forum for. Or if we have to litigate one specific civil issue. Um, neighbor's dog came over and dug up the flower bed. Okay, that's the issue. That you would litigate in a forum. That's a civil issue you would litigate in a forum. <clears throat> nothing, of course, nothing major. That's There's no, no in, uh, real injury. <clears throat> or should I say bodily injury or death? So if there's no bodily injury or death, it falls under civil. Okay, so again, we have to differentiate what's the difference between civil versus criminal. Well, um, again, no bodily injury or death, that means you can pretty much bet it's probably going to be civil. If it's financially related, it's definitely civil. Unless, of course, you get into bank robbery and extortion and, you know, how much money are we talking about? Because remember, um, the circumstances of the crime dictate how egregious the offense. Okay, so when you talk about does it rise to the level, that's what they're talking about. And so... Stealing a $10 bill is not as egregious as stealing $10,000. You see what I'm saying? I mean, I know that sounds simple and stupid, but it's just that simple. Don't make it more complicated than it is. So back to the original to the basics. Now, the basics are when you walk into the bare bones republic, you're going into a quorum setting. That's a group setting. Your group settings are in, uh, um, basically consists of as many people that are within the body who have the ability to comprehend what's going on, right? And um, one of the examples I use a lot to differentiate is 
if we're going to be talking about regulations and different things to the power grid, I would th certainly think you would want electricians or people that studied electricity to be present during that process, during that quorum. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and that's, you know, that's the reason that we assemble these things the way we assemble them is because we want these people properly um, set up. Somebody keeps calling me here. Hang on a minute. What the fuck? Oh. <laughs> Typical. Anyway. All right, I'm gonna have to put this on silent mode. As you can tell, I get an, I get nothing done, especially on the weekends. So anyway, one of the reasons that we assign these, when we talk about special, you know, um, technical subject matter, technical subject matter is anything that requires a science. So electricity requires a science. So, <coughs> In that quorum, we have to decide what's the scope, right? The initial meeting is to decide what the meeting is going to be about, as ironic as that sounds. Because remember, the big meeting is when we call all the members into assembly to vote on the thing that we're talking about from this quorum, okay? So this is kind of like everybody kind of like the meet and greet, so to speak, get to know each other. What are we talking about to bring your information to the table? Um, do you have any information or do you know anybody with information that would be relevant to the topic at hand? So when we write our scope document, right? Decide what's the scope of the thing we're gonna make, be making the decision on. Okay, we include everything within that document or within that action that needs to be there, okay? <clears throat> so that said, again, <clears throat> that is the difference between a quorum versus a forum. And one of the reasons why people have so much problem with courts is because instinctively your, your brain goes to the word quorum. Why? Because you're used to making decisions in groups. This is how they've sold to you. This is a democracy. Um, no, the, the, the only thing we do democratic is vote. Okay. Everybody participating in the quorum gets a vote, but that doesn't mean that Joe Schmuckatelli, you know, uh, plumber is going to participate in a quorum where we're talking about electrical power grids. It's just, it's, it's, it's stupid, right? It's, it's repugnant and it would never work. So this is where we get into, remember, we talk about these conflicts and where these conflicts arise and why people get so frustrated and confused over court. And the answer is because it is an improper forum based on what you're accustomed to doing in your daily life. Whether you realize the thing that you're participating in your daily life is called a quorum or not, again, this is you know, me trying to help you put this to, into perspective into your head so you can say when you move into the quorum, you can say, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, we, I work for, you know, ABC retailers and we used to do planograms and we would meet about those planograms. That, well, that meeting is a quorum. It's a small version of one, but it's a, it's a quorum format. Okay, so if you've ever done anything like that, you've done this process, right? So, I'm trying to make the point out to exactly how many times people have done this and don't even realize they've done it. So <clears throat> that said, let's break the let's 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 start getting into how E clause was constructed. Remember, tools in the toolbox, right? Here's what I had to work with: the executive, the legislative, the judicial. Well, what do we have to prove? First thing we need to, we, the three things we need to establish are status, standing, and jurisdiction. Okay, those are the points. So, 
pull that sucker out and you kind of quarter turn it and you set it back on there. And there is your, <clears throat> this triangle is where you have to work with when you're working this process. Now, my fiduciary status, that's this number, okay? My standing to present, that's this number. Um, this one being that real estate brokerage uh, license, this one being my um, notary credential. This is registered with the legislative branch. This is registered with the executive branch. Aha, so what did I do? I just bridged the gap between these two branches. I wasn't here yet. So we were backing and forth and trying to figure out where the hell we were gonna decide. Remember Congress, when we first started this, we were going in under 42, under Title 42. So let's start under Title 42. They said, okay, fine. <clears throat> and we back and forth it, right? And eventually, what had ended up in happening, because we could prove negatives, we got that opinion from Sam Sparks in the Texas case that said, well, if you're going to do this and you're serious about cleaning up a mess, you have to establish, we would, as judges, we want you to be able to say, okay, I can prove a negative, basically establish reasonable doubt in a bad prosecution or establish probable cause to prosecute. So in the, in the forum setting, that's their job is establish reasonable doubt or probable cause to prosecute. So now we know where the lines are. And because every one of these cases that I've worked, either we either hit reasonable doubt or we hit probable cause to prosecute, either or. So that said, the only thing that he could do, then they, that they could do in the meantime with my case, because Ohio decided they were going <clears> to, <throat> the swamp strikes back, let's just put it that way. So they pulled their little stunt that they pulled on me in May. Well, here's what that did for the court, because the court knew what I was doing, but they didn't know how they could help me. Here's what they do. Remember, there's a maxim of law that states the law helps those who are being deceived, not those deceiving. I was very clear, and again, in proving the fact that the court was deceived, I was deceived, we were all bullshit. So the only thing they could do was grant me standing, right? That's those mandates, and I went over that. It doesn't say them versus me, it says me versus them. Knowing that we had already decided what jurisdiction, it wasn't 42, 1983, 85, 86, because of the circumstances the jurisdiction we assigned was 28 USC 1443. So now I've got status, standing, and jurisdiction. All three are now covered. That's the reason, going back to the base model, the outer points of status, standing, and jurisdiction are necessary in our style and form of government. Those are the outer pillars of where you're standing, depending on what your subject matter is, okay? The emolument, the government itself, that's that center point. That's the fulcrum when you're talking about the design model. So when you, when you figure this out and you can pull it out, quarter turn it and set it back down on itself, you end up with judicial estoppel as it's an improper forum, okay? Again, um, some of the, some of the stuff in the, in a judicial estoppel are, uh, <coughs> I was going to screen share this, but I figured that, yeah, I'll just go ahead and get it out of the book because it's easier that way. Uh, and I think I need my eyeballs. I do. Yeah, definitely going to need going to need my eyeballs on this. So, all right, let's, let's start with a, an estoppel by negligence. This is, this dates back to 1875. It's an estoppel that are um, arising when a negligent person induces someone to believe certain facts 
and then the other person reasonably and detrimentally relies on that belief. Okay. <laughs> How did that apply in this matter? And it applied in this matter because the state of Ohio induced the state of Florida to believe that I owed a debt that I don't owe because I have the document that proves that I don't owe it. But because they're using that backdoor swamp, that repugnant crap, those guidance documents, that policy, right, that deep state, they're telling each other lies and the other one's saying, okay, yeah, I'll swear to that. Well, again, that doesn't work in our style in government. That is an improper forum. That is a star chamber, right? So again, when I applied judicial estoppel, that's why the Supreme Court said, yeah, they've already decided what the jurisdiction is. What the hell are you doing, Florida? You're walking around with your head up your ass. Mr. Howell was very clear in his back and forth in per this executive order, right, to inform both the legislator and the executive, and everybody had full disclosure. I was even informing the court, but I wasn't technically litigating. I said, look, yes, I understand that you guys need to be made aware of this because it's never been done in our history. So I'll pay you your due respect, <clears throat> which of course surprised the hell out of them. They're not used to people paying them their due respect. I said, well, shit, you know, if, if I want respect, I better show it. So, again, me doing my normal job, full disclosure, that's the fiduciary, fiduciary duty, right? And <clears throat> that's the duty. <clears throat> There's a reason that that duty is the strictest duty of care recognized by the legal system, just because of the way we construct documents to be processed through a quorum okay because there are a lot of people in you know um, in the private sector that get the documents that we send out either up to or out of the quorum they need to be done and done properly and in such a manner that's legible and comprehensible to the people that are going to be reading them Right. It's one thing to say something. It's something else for the person to be able to interpret what you're saying. So, <clears throat> again, that process right here takes place in the supposed to take place in the legislature in our style and form of government, not a court. Right. So that's the political argument, the debate. I went over this last night on the show and I'll read it again here real quick. We're talking about. Let's talk about debating, okay? Well, ah, here we are. What is debatable? All right, that's a very good question. What is debatable? As a general rule, the member of a, members of a deliberative body have the right to, delib, uh, to debate every substantive question presented to the body for determination. Yeah, you can debate the question. What they can't do is they cannot, this is where the butt comes in, but debate upon purely procedural questions is not a right of the members. In other words, <clears throat> if it's determined that there are going to be 50 people in this debate, there are going to be 50 people in this debate. That was agreed upon. You can't go in there and say, well, now I want to add 51. No. That, that would taint the process. We agreed collectively that we were going to have 50 people in this quorum to decide on what this scope document was going to look like. If somebody has relative information, they can submit a motion, a formal motion. Remember, let's go back to the motion practice, right? It's in this book, remember? In the motion practice, let's see here. That would be, that could be listed under a point of order. That could be listed as a parliamentary inquiry or a request for, or like request for information. 
Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> Objection to consideration of a question. In other words, when they asked to join the quorum, we said no. They they file an objection and write, request us to consider um, why we don't want to add that 51st person. Okay. So um, depending on how much time we have to participate in this quorum is going to depend on how much time we're going to give this motion to reconsider. So now you see what I'm saying? I've had to make these calls. So I know what the hell a judge is thinking and why they're thinking it. That's called a judgment call. Um, you could see, you could file a motion to amend. You could file a motion to close or limit, extend limits of the debate. Um, let's see here. There's a total of 40 different motions, right? And they're, they're, they're categorized, so they're subcategorized as privileged motions. Those are motions that are usually reserved for body members, for the members of the House and or the Senate. Then there are incidental motions. There are subsidiary motions. That's the one I filed recently, by the way. There are main motions, which are just that. It's a main motion. An incidental main motion, which are which have, uh, is broken down into many a subcategory. I believe there's what fifteen of those. So that's why I said you have to know the process that you're going to follow. And because again, this is what I did. Finding this book and being able to refer to the book was kind of a gift to me. So because it's like, oh, thank you, God, somebody actually put on paper what I did for a living because I. I never thought to do that. <clears throat> it was just something I always did. I didn't have time to write the book. I figured, you know, writing books is for other people. And me, I'm just there to do the job. And so again, <clears throat> this is the reason that in my process, the judicial estoppel always ends up in shutting the judicial branch down. And that we want to shut the judicial branch down because guess what? Those decisions, that's again, that's an improper forum. If you're going to allow them jurisdiction, allow them to try to trespass into your home and take your kids, um, then you allowed it. You have to stop it, right? where you take that complaint, that grievance against that government actor who walked into the legislature and said, oh, I'm qualified to do this job, right? They lobbied, right? And they got their approval only to walk out and abuse their privilege. Um, no, you can't do that, right? So that's why we go in and we take as much information back to the legislature as we can for oversight. Look, agency CPS said they were going to perform these duties when um, they came in and lobbied. Here's their organic act. Remember, we talked about that. I showed that in, in Nate's case, that organic order establishing the emoluments of the 446th District Court in Nectar County, Texas. That's the organic act. Okay, so... You find the Organic Act. Um, also, we covered this too. Um, Dave did a very good job of pointing this out on his remonstrance last night. He opened it with what document he's talking about. The um, Constitution, and he even said it was when it was signed, when it was filed. <clears throat> I'm sorry, when it was ratified. So, Again, he brought up the Organic Act, and he, of course, he told them by the end of that, that opening sentence there, what process we're going to follow pursuant to that document, okay? That's why I said this is, it can, it's as complicated as you make it, and the more information you give them, granted, it may take them a minute to process it because a lot of them have never done it, and that's okay. To err is human, to forgive is divine. But the point is, is they're going to reach a point like they did in Texas where the, even the judge is going to say, well, yeah, this is a political issue. That's your job, man. So if they're telling you to go 
pick up the Mason's book, you better go pick up the Mason's book or whatever book your state uses. And, you know, that's the process. Why? Because all political power is inherent in the people. So when we walk into that legislative branch and say, I have a petition, I have a bitch, a legitimate bitch against an actor in any one of these branches, right? Whether it's the executive branch, judicial branch, or the legislative branch, this is not this is not open. The only thing, like, for example, what's not open for debate is um, them deciding whether or not they're going to do it. They're going to do it. If they don't do it, they're derelict in that duty. And we recall them. And basically that you walk up to the <clears throat> sergeant at arms and say, you know, look, sergeant at arms, I am the petitioner, all political powers inherent in the people. This representative is not performing the duties under his emolument. Remove, please. And that's the removal process if they kind of give you one of those. But just know and understand the first time they give you one of those, they don't even know what they're doing. You got to remind them, look, doofus. Okay. I don't, I know, I know what Mr. Bar member is telling you. What Mr. Bar member is telling you is basically. I just be blunt about this. He's full of shit, right? So let me show you how I know that. And <laughs> you can, uh, like I say, this is the art of telling the the your representative that the guy's chatter in his ear is full of shit, and why. And the other problem with a lot of times those lobbyists developing relationships with our representatives, again, to interfere, right, obstruct, obstruct justice. And when we point these things out to the legislators that these lobbyists are actually obstructing justice by doing what they're doing, they're like, huh? And it's, believe it or not, that's the most common reaction I've seen to date is, what do you mean that's obstruction of justice? Oh, God. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, God. So, again, <clears throat> this is where you have to exercise a little bit of personal restraint and make them under, you know, just calmly go down the process with them and they'll, they'll pick it up, okay? We're starting to see evidence of this already in, in multiple cases and I can't wait till Nate comes out and tell, shares with you guys the movement that's already happening in his case. So I'm pretty happy to see that. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> when we talk about one of the things that when, you, when you're creating the thing that you want to create, don't ever forget what tools you have in your toolbox. I'm using this as the example of what I did. Because this is the design left for us by the forefathers, okay? I just studied it and duplicated it. I didn't do anything new. I didn't do anything special. All I did was picked up the freaking book and went, holy crap, that's what that means, right? So we're not talking rocket science here where nobody's going to Mars, right? This is just establishing true status, True standing and true jurisdiction, as Kirk would say, in the common law. The common law is the republic, the organic republic. As many times they're going to say, oh, the Constitution suspended, blah, 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 blah. No, it isn't. The Supreme Court has already said on more than one occasion, you're not going to fundamentally alter our um, founding documents which leads us to the pissing contest of they argue and litigate the 14th Amendment protections. And of course, my, my, I stand my ground and say, no, those are Ninth Amendment protections. I know you guys don't like the Ninth Amendment because it pretty much shuts down your entire shit show. So that's why you wrote this word salad 14th Amendment. Don't think, I was, again, I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. So <clears throat> just to kind of recap. Um, 
you walk into and you go to use your organic republic. That petition, that process is in the legislature, not the judicial branch. Why? Because you're going into the legislature to point out the bad actors from the various branches that have trespassed the law. So you don't walk into the crime scene and say, you committed a crime. How far do you think you're going to get by doing that? Probably not very far. So that specifically, we go back to the basics, petition the legislature. One more phone rings. I swear I'm going to shoot it. Um, and um, see that? That's why I hate the fucking phone. <clears throat> so you petition your legislature. You establish your status. You establish your standing. And you collectively establish your jurisdiction. Now, of course, depends on the subject matter. In my case, I was proving negatives. There's the appropriate subject matter because we did ask a federal judge and said, hey, what's the minimum standard for this? And they gave us the answer that we wanted. That was in the form of a dismissal order. But guess what? It still gave us the thing we wanted, which was what jurisdiction are we talking about? We already know the status and standing. So um that was the you know again that fills in that last gap for how i did it for how you guys are going to do it <clears throat> that would be a depends on your case i mean are you proving negatives not everybody not everybody understands and completely comprehends calculus um is it something just as basic as um hey, what jurisdiction should I choose if um, I have this problem? What would you guys recommend? And, you know, you can ask a question of law to just about anybody, right? You say, you say you know, look, I just basically have a question of law. What jurisdiction would you recommend? Go down through it and they say, well, this is a 42, 1983, 1985, 1986, but I know how that's going to turn out. Excuse me. That's how, uh, how it's going to turn out because there are specific elements that are not, that are not included in that, that fall outside of that. So under this circumstance, what would you recommend moving forward with my petition of remonstrance? That's a lawful action, Right. And as long as you ask the pe as long as you ask the guy or woman, um, in a reasonable tone of voice, like I say, you know, I do it in one page, right? What jurisdiction would you recommend? Chances are going to give you an answer, right? They might give you a scathing kiss my ass on the way out the door, but the fact of the matter is, you're going to get an answer. You might not like it, but you, at least you got an answer, and it's something you can take back to your legislators and say, okay, well, I asked this question, here's what the court said. So, you know, again, you're showing your legislators, your representatives, the people in the quorum, you're at least attempting, right? You're at least attempting to follow some semblance of process. The fact that they're, it's going to become very apparent that the actors in the judicial branch have become so hostile and arrogant, again, it's uh, it, it's not like that's any big secret. Um, they you know, it's like, you know, they, they they start to get this. Oh God, you see the hump, you know, the hangover thing going on. It's like, oh my God, what the hell was I drinking? And <clears throat> so they're starting to wake up. But <laughs> you know how it is. If you ever had a hangover, don't yell at somebody who's having a hangover. You're you're not gonna you're not gonna curry many favors with somebody who's a good somebody who's hung over if you walk in yelling at them. So anyway, um, in your establishment of your status standing and jurisdiction, why you do what you do, and how effective judicial estoppel is judicial estoppel cites the improper nature of the forum. Because the thing that they're alleging against you is a criminal in nature. And if it's criminal in nature, Again, 
to use a civil court as an improper forum. That's a judicial estoppel. Somebody induced this judicial actor to believe something that was bullshit, I think is the technical term. So uh, that's why you're saying when you take your petition, your remonstrance to the legislator, you can, that's, that's, a, def, that's a legitimate gripe, right? Yeah, you've got to weed up your ass, but you've got a legitimate gripe. That's kind of the difference that separates many of us from many of them is, um, well, I don't care what they're telling you. What they're telling you is full, they're, they're full of it. And here's how we can, here's how we know that. So I hope that kind of gets you guys established into how to actually work the, the actual Repub the organic Republic model and, you know, how it related to what I always did in um, in the quorum process, which again is how I recognized it. And I thought you guys should be, um, you know, taught, <clears throat> taught that, you know, of, you know, what I did, how I did it. I mean, and here's the good news. Many of these guys already know who I am. They know that not only am I doing this, they know I'm teaching it along the way. And it's not like it's any big secret that I've been teaching it along the way. So, you know, it's, they know that I exist. They, they verified my company. And um, I think with that, we're, uh, uh, I think that can pretty much, I don't want to go too long on this. I want to be able to keep it short for people that watch it later. And I'll answer the comments here as soon as I log off. But um, I wanted to go over that with you and make sure. So, yes, yes. So, yeah, some some will fit under the 83, 85, 86. Some will fit under, um, will definitely fit under the Title 18. Okay. But one of the things that... Um, <clears throat> One of the things that you need to, when, when you're going in to your quorum and you're discussing jurisdiction, okay, it depends on the, you know, not just the elements of your case, the evidence in your case, there are going to be a lot of outlying factors, things that you don't know. For example, what policy, what guidance documents were followed when that thing that they have was obtained? So if they have this piece of quote unquote evidence, but it was obtained unlawfully. Well, now that evidence is tainted. The entire case is tainted. That's cause to expunge, right? Well, in that expungement, you have to go through the quorum first, right? Decide what's going to be expunged in the scope. Is there going to be any prosecutions that arose from the trespasses that resulted in the uh, the evidence becoming tainted, somebody again, fruit of the poisonous tree. The evidence is the poison fruit. The tree is the action, the bad action of the person who tainted the evidence because it was you know not obviously not obtained legally or lawfully. So <clears throat> that is uh, that's the power of the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine. By the way, not uncommon. Use that all the time. And I think that pretty much should get everything going. I don't think there's really anything else I can think of off the top of my head. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things by establishing judicial estoppel, that's a good question, Bill, is when you shut down the judiciary, okay, you're putting a stop to their case. You're saying... <clears throat> in whatever judicial estoppel you use and how you write it. Um, look, if there was fraud in your case, fraud on the court, one of the best, most effective ways to shut down a bad case is point at fraud that was aimed at the machinery of the judiciary, right? Again, that's why we use the, the organic order in Nate's case. So we said, look, here's the judicial machinery, the order, According to the process, constitutional provisions are mandatory. In the order, it doesn't even say the word constitution. 
I can see where, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. I could see where that wheels came off the wagon there. And guess what? That was caused to issue a judicial estoppel on a, on a, on a, a bad, um, bad order that had come out of that court. Right. Not only was it plausible, we had it right there in front of them. It was easy to establish. So good question on that, but read your, your judicial estoppels because there's many different forms of those. And the one thing a judge can always do is shut down a bad case. That's the first thing, you know, reasonable doubt <clears throat> or establish probable cause to prosecute or reverse prosecute. That's a judicial estoppel any day of the week and twice on Sunday. And they will shut that shit show down. That's the one thing they will always do. So um, I think with respect to that, I think that pretty much ends it for, for the here and the now. And I will. Uh, Nate is my Texas buddy. So for those who don't know who Nate is. And with that, oh, I was going to do this. Apparently not. All right. And with that, I think I will go ahead and end this live feed. I hope it took, hope it did okay. So um, I'll be broadcasting this all over the place. So you guys will be able to share it and it'll be on the website, yada, yada, or YouTube page, yada, yada, yada. So I'll be seeing you guys on, I guess that's uh, Wednesday night. So much love, everybody. Have a nice weekend.